case for why you would want file level information to make intelligent placement decisions in a storage device. Now just imagine you don't have that information. You're on the other end of a SCSI interface. All right, so what we're going to try to do is get a little bit of that information back so that a storage developer can actually make the same kind of decisions that you would in a file system. So we need to somehow get the information from the file system or a database down into a storage device, but do so in a way that's interoperable. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about this project dif called Differentiated Storage Services. This is a project out of Intel Labs. It's about three or four years in the making, and we're starting to let it out of the labs, and we're going to have open source available pretty soon. Um, this is collaborative work with other folks within Intel. Intel's a big corporation, and so Jason Akers, my co-author, is here in the audience. Um, Fang wasn't able to attend, or Tian. We're taking numerous pictures for them. Um, and this is a collaborative work with Ohio State. So let's start with a fun analogy. Um, this really kind of gets the idea across. So a lot of students of the audience here, just look back to the last time that you moved, which was pretty recently, I'm sure. What's the first thing that you did? You got your black magic marker and you went and you classified all of your data, right? You did this so that you could better organize what was in each box. But more importantly, you need, needed to assign a quality of service to the data so that it was actually delivered in the right way. Right, so you contracted with some storage system, some moving company. Their job is to enforce your policies. They give you the, gave you the stickers like fragile, open me first, this side up. And then you, you took these handling policies, these quality of service uh, requests, and you assign these to each of your classes of data. Right? Now, you really didn't get in the business of determining whether they hand carried it or put it on a locked band or they put it on a train or, or a plane. Right? It was the responsibility of the storage system to respect your quality of service request and it made, makes the solution scalable, right? Now, we argue that computer storage should, uh, should operate in the exact same fashion, right? And it's somewhat surprising that, you know, the disk is well over 50 years old, that in over a half of, centu of century, no one's really challenged the read block, write block interface, right? And for better or for worse, it's kind of painted us into a corner, and storage system developers really have their hands tied in terms of the kind of optimization they can perform behind SCSI or behind ATA. And so that's the problem that we want to solve. Basically, by classifying your I.O., every single I.O. request, you specify a little bit of something about what you're reading and what you're writing. Who's reading it? Who's writing it? What application is accessing it? Um, and then we assume that quality of service is something that's going to differ across different storage system vendors. Right? So once we open up a classification framework, storage vendors can start competing on who has the best quality of service. Right? And then over time, standard quality of service levels will emerge. And then we leave it up to the storage guys to, to enforce this. So let's go ahead and apply the analogy now. On the right here, we have a storage system. We assume that there are multiple tool, tools of storage with different performance, reliability, maybe even security characteristics. We've got some intelligent QoS mechanisms that know how to, a little bit something about the application policies to determine which pool the IO actually needs to go to. On the left side over here, we've got our computer system. Could be a laptop, could be a big server system running some application or maybe a database. Um, we've got the operating system and then the file system. So we're saying that you can classify data everywhere in the host computer system. Wherever there's information about what you're reading or writing, let's try to capture that and send it along with the I.O. Right? But so we, we somehow need to compress that information into something that can actually fit in an I.O. request. Right? So here are some example classifiers. For example, we might have metadata that will request gets low latency service. Right? We might have boot files that the operating system would know about. For those, we also want low latency service, so your computer boots faster. What about small files? Maybe for a file server, we want high throughput for the small files, and for media files, we want high bandwidth. Right? So we assume that all of these classifiers are determined on the left side over here, and kind of use your imagination as to the number of ways that you can classify data. Okay? As far as the policies, once you've attached a storage system to your computer system, they'll have certain policies that are available. Maybe some are platinum, gold, and silver service levels, other are priority levels. We're not trying to standardize those yet. We're assuming that they'll be made available, well known, so then you just need to complete this mapping here. And it's very possible that a storage system vendor will work in collaboration with a computer system vendor to provide policies over here that are optimizing for something over here, like a database on a specific storage system. Okay? Now, the only thing that I didn't show here is how we get this classification across. What we're assuming is that you, you identify your classes offline. This is kind of a one-time thing for a database or a file system or any other application of interest. And then you assign these policies offline. 
Now you bring the computer system online, you mount your file system, you mount your database, all right? We need to pass the I.O. information across. Well, what we do is we just leverage a few reserved bits in SCSI, all right? What we're showing here is the group number, and let me go ahead and, and open this up so you can see it. So this is what a SCSI write request looks like. You specify your opcode, you specify the logical block that you want to start writing, and how many blocks you want to read or write, or writing in this case. This group number here is vendor specific. It's used mostly for accounting purposes, so you can tell which initiators are accessing which storage devices. Um, but since it's vendor specific, Intel being a vendor of computer and storage systems, we can define this how we want, right? So we're saying we're actually gonna use this group number to classify data, right? With five bits, you can get 32 different classes. If we tapped into these three other bits over here, we'd have a total of eight. Now you have 256 ways of classifying data, right? Given that we're not classifying data at all today in the storage system, 256 ways of classifying data is a lot to get started with, even 32 ways, right? So we're actually already starting to work with Key 10, which is the SCSI standards organization, to make sure that we can use this group number in the way that I'm gonna describe this morning. Now, so again, with five bits, we get 32 classes, but we can grow that over time if we, if we need to. And the file system prototypes I'm gonna talk about today, and even the database prototype, well fit within the five bit uh, classification space. So that general vision that I just shared, let's, let's focus now just on caching with solid state disks or any for, form of non-volatile memory. So we've got some fast SSDs. We wanna take those and plug them into a disk array in a way that makes sense. Now, unfortunately, the SSDs are a bit expensive today, so you can't replace all your rotating media. So the next best thing, let's, let's use it as a cache, all right? So the universal challenge in the industry, if you look at all the new products that are emerging, how do you keep the right data cached? People talk about these intelligent caching algorithms, how to detect hot and cold data and make sure that you do migration at the right time. And how do you avoid thrash under cache pressure? So you can very quickly fill up these SSDs and now you've got a bunch of dirty data that needs to be read from the SSD and written back to disk, right? And if you're doing all of this background traffic while you're actually trying to write new data, you just get into a thrashing situation. So the conventional approach is you can bypass the cache for things that you don't think need it. Like if you can do sequential stream detection, or you maybe you assume that a large request is serviced from disk just fine, right? You can evict cold data with things like LRU or LFU, but we know how well that works given that you, know, you need a certain amount of locality of reference and a lot of storage systems just don't have that. Big file systems are a classic example. Most of the locality of reference is serviced from the client that's actually attaching to the computer system. So what the, the storage, or the, to the storage system, what the storage system sees in the back end is just a bunch of random access and it's tough to cache when you see random IO. So what we wanna do is find a way to actually cache the stuff that's normally difficult to get from disk, but we need information to do that. So what we're saying is that IO classification can effectively in the context of caching, identify the cacheable IO classes. Not everything needs to be cached, but we leave it up to the operating system to tell us what should and shouldn't be cached. Then we can assign relative caching priorities to everything that goes down to the storage system. So when it comes time to actually evict something, you can evict the lowest priority thing first, right? This all sounds very obvious and simple, and that's the takeaway it is. We just need to open up the interface so that the computer system can, can communicate these caching priorities and the classes to the storage system, okay? So let's go ahead and, and, and focus a little bit and look at the actual classes we do for uh, EXT3 and Windows NTFS. We have, we have working prototypes for, for both of these. So notice that um, we've grayed out the classification box for applications in the DB and within the operating system. We're only classifying data in the file system right now. These are our general classes. Uh, I'll talk about caching priorities in a second. So we talk, we talk about file system metadata, the file system journal, directory entries, and then we take files and we break them up by size is one really easy way to differentiate between small, medium, and large files, which is great for a file server. They can't do that today. All right, so files smaller than 4K, and then we keep multiplying by four until we're out past a gigabyte. So this is our starting classification scheme if the goal is to optimize for small file I.O. and random access that, that uh, comes from small file I.O. and the metadata associated with small file I.O. So as far as caching priorities, we say that metadata is priority zero, which is the highest in our case, and then we start decreasing the priority until we get out past a gigabyte and that's lowest priority, All right? This is the only information that needs to be communicated to the storage system. We don't need to teach the storage system about journaling semantics or the format of directory structures for EXT3 and NTFS, which are obviously different. 
We just need to tell the storage system for every I.O. what's the relative caching priority for that I.O. and then let the storage system make a cache or a no cache decision. It's as simple as that. Let's look at the database now. The previous example doesn't distinguish data within a file. The database is an obvious exception, so we'll want a different classification scheme. So now I've grayed out the file system box, and we're going to be classifying data up in a database, right? So we talk about things like system tables, temporary tables, randomly accessed user tables, uh, more temporary tables. We distinguish reads from writes, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, sequential tables and index files. And with these, the database administrator knows where the hotspots are. The storage system guy doesn't. So we let the database administrator assign these relative caching priorities. For example, system tables are highest priority. It's the equivalent of file system metadata. Um, temporary tables, when you're writing them, are highest priority because you want to get those into the cache. As soon as you read a temporary table, you immediately evict it because you know that you don't need it anymore. The perfect example of where LRU gets it wrong. Right? In a lot of cases, we find in our database workloads that that temporary table is evicted, LRU style, before you have a chance to read it. And then once you read it, it brings it back into the cache and then holds on to it for a little bit. But if it knows the semantics behind temporary, it knows to hold on to it until it's read and then get rid of it. Right? One thing you can do with classification. And there are a couple of things here that we decide to bypass the cache altogether. For example, index files. You can get them from disk, disk relatively easily, and then you keep them in DRAM, and then you do all your random access to disk for, or, P, or uh, NVM, depending on what's in the index file. And sequential tables, we say let's go ahead and, and send those to disk as well. So notice that these caching priorities here, it's the same semantic that we use for the file system. So our storage system here doesn't care whether it's a file system or a database that's mounted. In the end, it just sees caching priorities. So we still maintain the interoperability. Okay. So in order to leverage this, we need some new caching algorithms. So the first one we call selective allocation. We basically selectively allocate or not in the cache, and we use the caching priorities to determine those. For example, you can say, let's always allocate file system metadata or database system tables, regardless of the amount of cache pressure, because we know if those aren't allocated, we have to go to disk to get them, and it's going to be expensive. There are some things that we conditionally allocate based on the state of the system. So if your cache is quickly filling up, maybe you fence off lower priority I.O. Well, the priority information you get is sent down from the host operating system, so now you know what's low and high priority. Now, obviously, the cutoff between high and low is going to be a tunable parameter when you decide to fence off certain things. And we let the storage system make that call because it knows best about its internal resources. And when admitting additional I.O. into the cache is just going to lead to a thrashing situation. As long as the OS can specify its total ordering in terms of cache priorities, it just relies on best effort service from the storage system, which is a lot better than what you get without priorities. The second flip side is selective eviction. So once we get a bunch of data into the cache and the state is dirty and we need to make room for new writes or new reads, we need to start evicting. Okay? The obvious thing is to just do LRU or LFU eviction, but we all know that that just doesn't work that well. So what we do is we evict in priority order, starting with the lowest priority first. Right? Um, for example, the temporary database tables can be evicted before the system tables. Right? And now the storage system doesn't need to know the difference between system and temporary. It'll just see the priority. Now, this can be trivially implemented in existing storage systems that already do read-write caching. They just main one, maintain one big LRU list. What we say is, OK, main, maintain that LRU list, but for each class of data, for each priority of data. So now you can see there's maybe an LRU list for file system metadata, another one for database system tables. And now with the storage controllers, it's really easy. It just picks the lowest priority LRU list and starts evicting from that. When that's exhausted, it goes to the next lowest priority one. So you can see that big sequential data, if we decide to admit it into the cache, will just evict itself over time instead of evicting higher priority like, like small files uh, and metadata. Okay, so that's kind of the high-level view. Let me, let me dive into some details about how we actually did it with uh, Linux EXP3 and Windows is very similar. So these are the actual classes that we use for ext3, and we were exhaustive here. We went through ext3 and every read or write request in the file system. By the context of where you are in the file system code, you know what you're reading or writing. So super blocks, group descriptors, bitmaps, inodes, indirect blocks, this is all ext3 stuff. And then we define the file sizes in e ext3 as well. So we've got 18 different classes, and these are our caching priorities. All of these are high priority metadata, which is class zero, and then we give the files decreasing priority until you're out two files past a gigabyte. 
Now keep in mind, this is optimizing for general file system performance where the files are typically accessed sequentially and the small files and their metadata lead to a lot of random disk access. This is the classic example with the file server. And again, I'll show a different way of doing it for the database. Um, so these group numbers here, this is the only information that we embed in the SCSI CDB. Right, so again, these are just textual descriptions so we can, we can debug it, but the storage system just sees, oh, group four and the priority of group four is zero. So let's do the, the thing that we do with priority zero. So for the OS, very few changes in, to the block layer. We had to add this classifier to every block level I.O. request, and in Linux speak, that's the Linux bio, and so that that's, goes all the way up and down the stack. Um, in the I.O. scheduler, we had to make sure that we only coalesce two requests if they're contiguous on disk and they have the same class, right? Since there's only one group number field in the SCSI CDB, we can't really coalesce a bitmap I.O. with an inode I.O. because we can, we're gonna lose one of the classes. So we give, a look, give up a little bit in terms of how much we can coalesce, but we totally make up for it in the back end by providing differentiated services to all these different classes here that aren't coalesced. Um, and then finally, and this is actually a one-line change to Linux, just copy the classifier into the SCSI CDB, that five-bit field, right? So we've got a kernel patch here that we're gonna be releasing pretty soon. Um, as far as ext3, again, we just went through the file system code and identified every read or write, and then if you knew a little bit about ext3, it's easy to pick these out. This is just a, almost a weekend exercise. Um, and again, optimize for small files and metadata. Now, it's important to note here, this is a one-time change to the file system. We don't have to redo this classification. We don't have to redo the priorities if we take the file system and move it to a different storage system, assuming that storage system implements priorities. If the storage system implements, say, platinum, gold, and silver service levels, then we'll want to replace each of these priorities with the appropriate service level. So that's the only extra work that needs to be done for portability. So let's look at what happens before I talk about caching yet, when you just turn on the classification. So now picture yourself on the other end of a SCSI controller, and you're seeing the I.O. coming down, right? Normally, you just see whether it's a read or a write. You see the LBA, and you see the link, okay? What we're showing them now is there's a group number. So here are all of our classifiers, and we do a little translation here so you can see what it's for. So if we're writing a small bit of data to the file foo, we're gonna get a read, modify, write. So now in the storage system, you can already see the read, modify, write right here, reading out the four kilobyte page, writing out the four kilobyte page. We see some journal I.O., and since I synced the file system, we see the inode being written out clean. Seven I.O.s to write 13 bytes, 28K, a lot of overhead there, and so you wanna be smart about where these I.O.s go. So just imagine yourself as a storage system vendor, you can make an intelligent decision that you couldn't before. You can say, okay, let's cache all the journal I.O. and fast and VRAM, cache the inode, because that's metadata, and since this file's small, let's go ahead and cache that too. All right, and so it's just with a simple classification like this, the storage guy can now start making those kind of decisions where he couldn't before. With NTFS, we didn't have the luxury of modifying NTFS source code, but they've got a nice filter driver architecture so we can get all of the same information above and below NTFS. Uh, and that prototype's up and working right now. Okay, so now let's switch gears to the database. This is what the database uh, classification scheme looks like. A little more detail here. All the unclassified data is before the database is brought online. Same thing with the file system. When you run makefs, everything comes through as unclassified. It's not until you mount the file system that you actually see the classes. But we talk about in the database, the transaction log, system tables, free space maps, uh, temporary tables, random sequential index, and then reserve. Notice here that I'm starting where the file system class is left off. We went from one to 18 in the file system classes, and so now we're starting at 19. So we're starting to use up this five bit space. The five bits, once we release this, we think will go quickly. So we're lobbying with T10 to get more bits. Um, you can think about how you could combine database classes with file system classes in an interesting way. For example, a database stored in a large file could benefit from file system classification on top of the database classification. We're not doing that yet, we're keeping them separate. Um, so these are the different group numbers and those get sent down. Now, the biggest challenge with this one was how you get the classification information from user space into the kernel. With, um, with uh, Linux and the file system, it was really easy because you were in the kernel, so you could go ahead and modify the I.O. request yourself. With Postgres, it's living in user space, you have to go through and somehow pass a classifier through the POSIX interface. We didn't want to change POSIX too much, so all that we did is we created a new flag, O classified. When you open up a file with O classified and you do scatter gather on that file, you just send one extra list element which contains your classifier. So in this case, we're sending down the text string hello world, which is our data, and we send down class 19. 19 can be anything. 
And so now we just have to modify the OS a little bit to look for the O classified flag and extract that classifier and then attach it to the SCSI CDB. Okay. As far as cache implementation, we have uh, what we're calling RAID level 9 in the Linux kernel. We needed some way of actually managing a cached volume. So rather than come up with a new way of managing volumes, we're just using Linux MD ADM. And we can do something similar for Windows. I won't go into too much more detail here, but the basic idea is when you create a cached volume, you specify your cache device and a base device, which could both be RAID levels. And so it's really easy to create this cached volume, have the classification information get passed through without teaching administrators about classes or anything like that. Okay. So experimental setup, we've got a hardware RAID array with an X25 eCache from Intel. We modified Linux 2634, we patched it in the way that I described, and we ran spec SFS and TPCH. I'm just going to talk about spec SFS today. So let's first look at the cache contents right after you run the workload. So now, from the perspective of the storage controller, we can see all the different data that's actually cached. This is the percentage of write requests and reads. It's about 60-40, and this is the contents of the cache. So you can see that most of the cache is filled with large files. Spec SFS creates an interesting distribution of small file and large file. Most of the data comes from large files. Most of the access is to small files. So it, it, it reeks, uh, it's really horrible for file server performance if you don't cache the right thing. With LRUS, which is the LRU with selective allocation, what we've done is we've restricted the amount of cache space that the large files can use. So now you can see that we've got a bunch of 60 or 256 kilobyte files where you only had a few of them down in here. We can also see metadata. We can see small files. We can see the 64 kilobyte files. Right, so the real takeaway here is that you end up caching what really needs to be cached. You fence off the large file I.O. In terms of performance, this is interesting. The hit rate on LRU and LRUS is identical because, well, you're, you're hitting on the same amount of information. You're just hitting on, on different information, right? So what would you rather hit on, a large sequential file or a randomly accessed file? I'd rather go to disk for the large files, right? Leave the small files in cache, and that's what we can do here. So don't be misled. Even though the hit rates are identical, the performance is totally different. With sync or overhead, we're finding that with LRU, we're actually doing a lot of movement of data reading the dirty entries from S the SSD and writing them back to disk, and that gets in the way of foreground traffic. Over 50% of the I.O. in the storage system for SFS was just moving data back and forth. With LRUS, we fence off large data, so we don't have to worry about that. That means an increase in I.O. throughput, and with running time, we actually get an 80% speed up running SFS by caching less data. We're just caching the right data, okay? Interestingly, the file latencies are also reduced quite a bit. And you can see outliers with LRU. These are all the different SPAC SFS file sizes. And these outliers differ across each run. And so what we're seeing is for some of these, you actually end up writing that file when the sinker is busy trying to clean the cache and you get hit with a huge outlier. You don't see these outliers with LRUS because we fence off large files when there's cache thrash and we just avoid the cache thrash altogether. But we still let in the small files. And with read latency, you can really see our performance boost here Files 256K and smaller are almost entirely served out of cache. And so we get latency reductions relative to no cache at all, north of 90%, right? The trick is getting those small files into the cache. Okay, I'm gonna skip over TPCH and we're gonna time for that. So as far as conclusion, um, the conclusions, intelligent caching, this is just the beginning. This is our, our immediate focus. Think of other types of performance differentiation and think beyond performance. Think maybe security, reliability, retention, not everything, for example, needs to be three-way replicated. Not everything needs to be encrypted. Not everything needs to be securely erased. If we can let the operating system specify what each I.O. needs, then we can enforce this in the back end in the ways that I described. Other apps that we're looking at, uh, databases, more than just PostgreSQL, we're interested in working with database vendors to modify the real commercial databases. Hypervisors, imagine a system with hundreds of virtual machines now getting differentiated service because we describe which VM is accessing the storage and what they're accessing inside that VM. Cloud storage, big data, and the list goes on. So as I said, work is already starting in T10. It's just started. I'm actually going down to uh, Las Vegas after this to pitch this to the standards guys. Uh, and so we'll see what they think about it. And we're going to have open source released uh, pretty soon as well. And so look forward to that. And that's it. Questions? Hey, uh, I'm wondering, uh, may Samuel Wander from your research. I'm wondering what happens if you have applications from multiple different vendors 
and how do you motivate them to be nice to each other and assign a reasonable priority to their workload? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So right now, the applications we're focusing on are file systems and databases. Those are the key ones. In the 90s, there was this technology called differentiated services for networking. It was a free-for-all. All the applications were saying, I want the highest quality of service. And so if you're like a Cisco router, you get all this high priority I.O. coming down, which is like no information at all. So we're assuming the file system or the database arbitrates those resources. And so we uh, talked to present in next talk, a fire mm -hmm. is not a fire. Uh, there are sometimes a fire already ha contain a lot of information because a fire is not only a fire contain maybe it is a, a d database and a small mm -hmm. file system for example the Microsoft Word uh, doc mm -hmm. format so how can you get uh, the metadata in such a file because it is uh, from the file system perspective it is uh, the data of the file instead of the metadata yeah and so that's where the file system only knows so much about the structure of the yes. file but not the contents yes so for example if you've got a, a database stored in a file mm -hmm. you'd want classification from both sides right mm -hmm. so yes. in general if you just focus on the computer system classes of data that for whatever re reason need differentiated service that defines how you classify things mm -hmm. some of that can be done within the file system itself like data versus metadata mm -hmm. and then once you need to know what's inside the file you go up to the application like okay. the database okay. to give you a little information about okay. what's inside okay so I think it's security and uh, fairness is maybe important. You have to trust the, uh, the, the, the application to give you such information, right? Well, it, again, our application is the database. Yes. Right, we're not, it's so it, general purpose applications, things get a little scary there. We don't want to open up that interface yet. Okay. But there are only a handful of file systems that matter and a handful of databases that matter. So these guys can play well together in a way that we think is feasible. Okay, okay, thank yeah. you. Walter Schwarzkopf from Cambridge. Um, I have a question about the uh, coalescing you did, yeah. uh, you d you're doing. So you said you only coalesce same class mm -hmm. requests. Now, have you looked at the impact of that? Because you could imagine that having a positive as well as potentially a negative impact because it might reduce the overall amount of coalescing you do yeah. or it might give you better coalescing. Have you uh, done any evaluation of that? Well, it definitely has a negative impact if you don't do anything with the uncoalesced request. So if you just don't coalesce, then you're actually sending more I.O., right? But what we've shown with spec SFS and with the database workload is that even when you don't coalesce as, as aggressively, you make up for it in the back end when you get the small important things cached. And so the, the trick is you have to pay the tax of not coalescing in order to get the benefit of what you can do in the back end storage system. Right, so un uncoalescing by itself, it, only, it can only hurt performance. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Nitin Agarwal, NEC Labs. I had a more implementation-oriented question. So if I understand correctly, you're uh, relying somewhat heavily on the reserve space in the SCSI CDB. Uh -huh. And let's, from, uh, it's probably fine for now, but let's for a moment assume that you know, that reserve space is reserved for a reason and you cannot use that. Mm -hmm. That would force you to you know, potentially open up an out-of-band channel or use another block, yeah. causing a series of very complicated changes to the you know, right. SCSI. And so have you thought at all about it? I mean, we that want to avoid out-of-band. Because you, when you want to make a caching decision, you need that information right, right then. If you have to have a special command to catch up with the command or you have to wait for it, then it's sometimes the information arrives, it's, it's not there on time. You would need some kind of chain transaction or something. Yeah, to, to and you could also statically uh, classify blocks when they're first written, like this range of blocks has this classification, but we don't want to do that either because there's a lot of reuse of blocks in the, in the file system in the database. So if we can't get the group number, there are extended SCSI CDBs. There are other ways of getting bits in the actual read or write command itself, and we'll explore that with T10. But right now, all the conversations we've had with the standards guys, they say that that group number, a few folks use it, IBM's one, um, and we would just have to define that we're using it in a different way. That also would come into play if you... If you uh, oh. Again, Peek Facebook. So earlier on, you're, you're saying that people would describe what the data is. And in this last slide, you were describing uh, how people would instruct uh, the system what to do. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that lots of people will, will ultimately decide, oh, I send a special flag to the storage system to tell it what to do. Mm -hmm. So is there a reason you chose to go with the description of what it is instead of what to do? Well, the reason that we separate classification from policy is to make life easier on the person developing the software. So you classify your data once, like a directory is always going to be a journal. And then later on, depending on the storage system, you apply that mapping. So in our EXT3 prototype, if we would have gone in there and just hard-coded priority levels, it would have made sense at the time. But if a new storage system comes along that's not based on priorities, we have to go back and think about what each of those priorities meant. 
right? And we have to do a translation there. So rather than do priorities from the beginning, we just classify as step one as a level of indirection before you do the actual policy assignment. It just makes it, it's, it's easier for the software perspective.